Hello, let's look at using Execute SQL Task to call the stored procedure to update a row. We'll include a couple of input parameters for the stored procedure and we'll make sure it has robust error handling. Let's just create a new Execute SQL Task and drop it into the control flow. But before we start configuring that, let's have a look at the stored procedure that the task is going to call. I'll just pull that in across and here we have the stored procedure. Let's see how this works. Um, you've got the create procedure line, schema HR, there's the procedure name. This is the first parameter it's expecting, uh, just an integer called at ID. Uh, this is the second parameter it's expecting. Uh, at last name, um, string and varchar. Both of these parameters are okay to come in as null. This is what the equals null part does. But once within the stored procedure, if they are null, it's going to cause an error to be thrown. There's the at ID. If it's null, throw an error with this message. Um, and there it is for the, the other parameter. Uh, so as we've been saying, error handling is really important, especially if this is going to be well, if this is going to be used in a production environment. So if we expect this stored procedure to get two parameters uh, with values, then we need to throw an error if one or other value is missing. So these two lines are to catch that a parameter with no value. In SQL 2012 onwards, we now throw errors. Um, previously, uh, pre uh, SQL Server 2012, we used to use raise error. Uh, so this line in 2012 onwards uh, would have been done using this block of code, um, which, as you can see, is just a bit more ponderous, cumbersome. So I just included this just to show the pre-2012 method. Um, going back a couple of steps, we're uh, doing a couple of settings here. Um, set no count on, that's a common one, just to avoid row count messages, which are generally ignored. Uh, the other one, a bit sort of debatable whether it's needed here, because later on you'll see we're using begin try and end tries, begin catch, end catch. So this is a limited usage uh, when you're using uh, try catches. But it could just possibly have a use, um, a purpose, if a client aborts but holds the connection open. So probably not that important, but just put it in there just in case. Okay. So, this is the heart of the stored procedure, where it's um, doing the actual update here. Um, inside a transaction and inside a try block. Uh, so any problems within this block and it's going to be caught in the catch block later. So, it does its update. It sets rows update, uh, rows updated to at at row count, just to make a note of that at row count because that immediately becomes set by the statement, the latest statement. So we have to make a note of it straight after the update statement. Uh, and then using the variable at rows updated, we can then say if it's less than or equal to zero, um, we throw an error to say it's failed to update a row. We expect it to update one row. So if it's less than or equal to zero, that's a problem. And if it's greater than one, um, then that's a problem too. And we're going to throw uh, updated multiple rows. So as I say, any errors thrown in this block here are going to go to this catch block here. 
Um, and it's going to roll back the transaction and then it's going to throw again. What that means is it's going to regenerate the error. So that's going to be caught by our task calling the stored procedure. And that's it. That's the stored procedure. It's about as straightforward as it could be to update a row with a, using a couple of input parameters uh, and include enough error handling to make sure any problems are caught. OK, let's see if this stored procedure does its job properly. Um, just got some test code here. We'll just make sure we start off with the surname of Asher for this particular person ID equals 7. Um, so let's just have a look at that. There we have it, surname Asher for person ID 7. OK, so if we call this stored procedure, um, we can set the first parameter to 7 and the second parameter to baggins. Hopefully, it'll complete successfully and hopefully you'll now see surname of Baggins. So it's done its job okay. Um, but let's also see what happens if we make a go wrong. Let's put in an ID of 777. There isn't a row for that ID. Uh, as you can see. Look at that. So there's no row for that particular ID. So when we call the stored procedure with that parameter, set it to 777, it should go wrong. And it does. And there we have our error. Failed to update a row. So that looks good. Just go back to here. We can see that. That's where it's come from. Failed to update a row. So that looks good and we can get back to working on the task. Right, let's get our management studio, just push that out of the way and get back to our data tools and look at the task. Um, we need a couple of variables um, to feed into the stored procedure parameters. Um, let's call one the person ID Um, we'll not worry too much about the scope, we'll just keep that at package level for this demonstration. Uh, it's going to be link 32. Um, we want to set it to a value of 7, um, because that's the row we've been working on in our example. And that's it. And then we need another variable. We'll call that um, the surname. Again, just keep the scope at the package level. This is going to be string. And we're going to set this value to cotter. OK. Um, I generally name SSIS variables as in this sort of style. It's just a lowercase v at the front to indicate variable and then some meaningful name or phrase. Um, it just makes it a bit easier to spot user variables if you put a V in front of them when SSIS uh, shows variables in one long list, including system variables. And it helps a bit too when you're passing variables into script tasks. Some people like to indicate the data type with a prefix. Um, but I think with the average SSIS package will have a limited number of variables and if you know a variable is going to be used, how it's going to be used, you know it's data time because uh, I've never found that much value in that with SSIS work. Okay. So that's the variable sorted out. Let's get rid of this window for now and get started on configuring the execute SQL task. Right, let's get this configured. Um, connection type, OLADB, we're going to stick with that for the first example. We'll do a second example with ADO.net. Connection manager, that one. Um, SQL statement, 
Got one handy. This is what we need to do. Let me just magnify that. So this is it. This is execute the stored procedure name, two parameters, and um, notice that the values are question marks. Mm. Let me show you a table about placeholders. We're using OLADB in this first example, so the placeholders are just question marks. Um, okay, let's get that out of the way. Okay, to that. And then look at parameter mapping, and we'll add some parameters in. Always a bit annoying this, you have to widen it to be able to see what's going on. Just uh, spread those out a bit. Um, okay, so the first variable needs to be the person ID, it's input, it's going to be a short in this example. And the parameter name, slightly strangely, is zero. Um, reason being, this is how they're numbered for OLADV. This is how they're named for OLADV. Okay. Uh, second variable is the surname. There it is. It's an input. It's going to be an nvar char. It's going to be following on with the way it's mapped. It's going to be number one. Uh, it's a string, so we need to tell it, by the way, is parameter size. We need to tell it it's 50 characters in this example. And that's it. So we have a look at code. Uh, at ID is question mark. At last name is question mark. Um, so the first parameter should be for the ID, so we just check we've got this down the right way. The first one should be for the ID, that's fine. Right, so we can OK that. Uh, let's just remind ourselves the table values before we run it. So at the moment, this particular row we're interested in for person ID 7, is surname Baggins. So we run the task, complete successfully to stop the debugger, bring across the management studio, and now the surname's changed to Cotter, which is as expected. So that's great. Let's move that out of the way. And that's fine. That's the OLADB example done. Right, let's do that second example using ADO.net. Uh, start again. Let's start a new execute SQL task. Uh, before we configure it, we can do with just changing the variable value so we can see that it does something new. Just change that to doors. And then configure this. So this time it's going to be radio.net uh, with this connection manager for radio.net. And the SQL statement this time it's just the name of the stored procedure. Uh, let me just copy one in. There we go. So notice no exec no parameters. What we do need to remember to do is to tell ADO.net it's going to get a stored procedure. So we need to change that to true. And then let's move over to the parameter mapping. Again, we've got this bother of seeing what's going on. We'll just spread everything out a bit, widen it up. And add our variables. So first variable we need to talk about is person ID. It's an input, it's going to be an int32, that's right. Um, but the parameter name. The parameter name this time is going to be that ID because that is the actual name 
of the parameter for the stored procedure. Um, just bring a chart across again to have a look at. So we're doing ADO.NET this time, uh, and there are no placeholders within the SQL, but the parameter names are actual for the stored procedure. These are the stored procedure parameter names. So we get out the way. So we've got the first one in, and we add the second one in, which is the surname. It's an input. This one's a string, and we have to put in the actual stored procedure parameter name at last name, and it's 50 characters big. So there we go. Those are the parameters mapped. We can OK that. And then we just remind ourselves the current value. So that's Cotter, surname Cotter at the moment. So we run the task. Complete successfully. And Cotter has changed the doors. So that's good. Just move the management studio out of the way. And stop the debugger. Of course, we're not finished until we know the error handling works fine. So let's change a 7 into a 777 for a row that doesn't exist. Um, and rerun it, see how it goes. So execute it. And it's failed which it should do. And the error is error failed to update a row. So that's great. We expect it to fail, it has failed and it's come up with the right error. And that's it. That's uh, using execute SQL task to update a table.